Welcome back, Mighty Vandals, to Tubs of the Club, brought to you today by Snake River Stampede Whiskey, but we'll tell you a little bit more about them later in the show. We are the Idaho Vandals affiliate on the Big Sky Podcast Network. I am your host, Dallas Hammer, joined today by Brian Marceau, breaking down, instantly breaking down, uh, instantly 21, 22 hours later, breaking down Idaho's 31-29 loss to Weber State over the weekend. Brian Idaho jumped out to a 10-0 lead midway through the second. Ended up trailing 14-13 at half. Uh, Weber State scored just before halftime. And then Idaho did not lead again on the way to a 31-29 loss. That is pretty demoralizing still 24 hours later. I'm going to kick it to you. What are your thoughts? So, by the way, Dallas, I love. I feel that your tone right now is perfect for how essentially all of our listeners feel about this game. Um, no, dude, this uh, this was for sure a letdown. Um, Idaho was cruising to, you know, if Idaho went one out and of the three Big Sky teams Idaho was competing with, Idaho had objectively the easiest final two games of the season. And uh, we've had two weeks in a row of Idaho playing some of their worst football of the year at the worst time uh, for that to take place. So, I mean, the big, big picture is, uh, look, this this one hurts for sure. Uh, you know, hey, the sky is not falling. You know, Idaho, if Idaho takes care of business next week, a, pl- a seed is not yet off the table. Actually, on the Power Rankings episode tonight, I'll be breaking down Big Sky Conference uh, playoff seeding implications for the not just the Big Sky games, but the other contenders for those top eight seeds, uh, which means we will not talk about today. But, um, you know, I to me, the story of this game, Dallas, and hey, we're already aborting what went well, what did not. Um, the story of this game for me is missed opportunities for Idaho. Um, and what I'm going to look at first is, you know, you talk about Idaho being up 10, 10-0. Idaho in the first half uh, had the ball for 20 minutes. Weber State had the ball for 10 minutes and Idaho was losing. Uh, Idaho's down 13, 14 and a half. And in those 20 minutes had accrued just a, like six or eight fewer yards than Weber State had in that first half. And that's, look, that's the first thing I'm going to point to. Idaho had a chan- had multiple chances early to put this game to rest after those first three drives. Truly. I feel Idaho should have been up at least 17 to zero. And then Idaho, then Idaho milking the clock is a little bit different than it is the rest of the way. But look, Idaho and in the same way I said to, to me, Idaho didn't, Idaho didn't execute. Idaho did not take advantage of the times they had to shut the door. Weber state seemed like when that, when big plays were needed, the wildcats were batting about a thousand. And they made big completions. They had timely sacks. They did not really have many timely penalties. I mean, the only thing with Weaver they didn't capitalize on is Weaver didn't miss a field goal early. So, look, before we like talk about in, like the individual matchups, individual facets, I mean, to me, Weber State, who is – look, this is a bad loss on paper for Idaho. Objectively, Weber State's underwater record-wise. Uh, the best they can do is finish 500 in FCS play. Uh, but Weber State's not a bad team. Uh, Weber State's coming together at the end. They're looking like the team we a lot of us picked them to be early in the year right now. And a team with that talent playing well and Idaho kind of stuttering a little bit. I mean, Idaho just – we Idaho doesn't have the depth yet uh, to, to kind of struggle at all in any of the key positions or to struggle much with injuries, which I'm sure you'll get to. But that's that was a story to me. Um, Idaho did not ex- – Idaho could have killed this game early. And Idaho had chances to take the lead where other timely turnovers killed the Vandals. And when Weber State had the chance to step up, they did. Yeah, Brian, uh, you mentioned the injuries there. And that that is honestly, it's what feels like is going on right now. And it's it's tough. It's tough to have watched what Idaho's peak was. Maybe, you know, obviously three, four weeks ago, you have the, the high of the Montana State win and then the low of the Montana loss. But uh Overall, I think you could say Idaho had played better football than they had the last two weeks. And it, it unfortunately, I think it just comes down to just being dinged up. Like you said, you know, we, we talked about this, honestly, in the preseason show. Idaho's big problem was going to be depth on the lines. And unfortunately, I think we're seeing that now as the offensive line continues to lose guys. And it just it's just not working out as well as you'd hope. Uh, you you come into Weber State, uh, a tough place to play for sure. Uh, again, like you said, a team that was underwater, but now with Munoz, they, you know, their, their talent seems to be kind of clicking in the way that, honestly, they probably should have all year long. I think if Munoz plays the whole year, this is probably a playoff team. Uh, and by probably, I mean, this is certainly a playoff team. The, the upgrade from Weissner to Munoz is absolutely asinine. But 
it was really it's really just demoralizing brian it's tough to see like we all have these dreams and wants of Idaho being a top five program. And I think that's where things are headed. I think you have this game even next year, much less two years from now, Idaho just steamrolls in this game, but that that's not what happened. Uh, Giovanni McCoy goes out there and throws 51 passes. They run the ball 27 times. It, obviously not the kind of split that Eck is looking for, but he averaged 2.7 yards of carry. Uh, and I know that uh, McCoy sack numbers are going to, change that a little bit but it's just tough man it, it's not not one of those days you you feel great about we talked about it in the the uh, the preview show weber state's key to victory is win the turnover battle have a couple good special teams plays and all of a sudden this is a close game that they can win and that's exactly what happened and it's frustrating to see how close idaho is uh, but idaho is also on that knife's edge of you have to be pretty perfect if you're going to have to deal with these injuries again, Anthony Woods was out. I, I don't think that was necessarily the the reason that Idaho lost, but I think that would have helped. I think Nick Romano is a is a great guy. I think he's a great player. I've really enjoyed watching him have this comeback. But he averaged 3.8 yards a carry today or, or yesterday, I should say, wasn't quite as uh, as explosive. Obviously, as we see with Anthony Woods, sometimes breaking out of tackles behind the line of scrimmage and then taking off an eight ten yard gain. Just Lost a not, huge fumble too. Yeah, the, yeah. I, I try not to try not to mention the fumbles, but man, Romano's fumble was a killer. JJ's fumble was probably even worse. Just but not both of them were drive killers. Idaho is driving on both those fumbles. Yeah, just not you know, a perfect storm of of bad things. Um, Tom Kendall shouting out, "We need more help in the trenches, uh, both sides, but more on offensive line." Uh, Patty saying lines to the key, and then Tom mentioning only three guys got carries yesterday, and one of them was Vani. Yeah, Romano had 22 carries, Jermaine Jackson one carry for 10 yards, and then Giovanni had uh, you know, four registered attempts because of the the sack totals. But uh, don't understand why we can why we can play a few more Woods. Uh, don't understand why we can't play a few more running backs with Woods out. Fully agree, Tom. I I would have loved to have seen some of those freshman kids. Uh, you know, Again, Eli Anthony Cummings came in as a as was great. Yeah, Eli Cummings. I still don't know what's going on with him. I think he's like fully redshirting. Yeah, I he's think, redshirting. You, I mean, you still could technically play a game there and keep the redshirt. I, you know, I I don't know what goes into those decisions, but Brian, I know I, I'm like long winded rambling here, but this was just the perfect storm of I don't think the offensive line can pick up for any missed opportunities be it from the coaching staff not taking enough deep shots idaho not converting on the ones that they took and then when you're you don't have anthony woods breaking huge plays and you're again romano i think he's doing great but his, his longest run was 10 was 12 yards like just you don't have the pieces to get through the perfect storm of bad okay well now we have to give weber state credit too because like part of why i believe there were not as many deep shots as like some of us might have liked is this look this is what weber state does defensively is they do their bet like they blitz some but they, this was not like montana with the number of blitz, blitzes weber state called uh weber state tries to keep everything underneath and you know their bend don't break philosophy is that as the field shortens those gaps are just going to vanish and that worked to a t early in early in this game especially when I look, Idaho, true, I think Idaho should have been up a minimum of 17 0. Honestly, 21 0 re, could have reasonably been on the table too instead of 10. But that's that is what Weber State does when their defense is clicking. And I guess, I guess this is the other question that I, I think is hard uh, with the offensive line Idaho has, which it's no secret. Idaho's weakness is pass protection on, on the offensive line is the more shots you the more deep shots you call the more chances you have for a strong Weber State team to get to the quarterback and look Giovanni McCoy we had there's some discussion in the, in the hashtag only tubs discord patreon.com backslash tubs the club to become a member just 250 a month but we like more than 250 a month too a lot of discussion about McCoy looking hurt and for sure on the sideline his gait looked a little weird and for sure, after a hit he sustained in the first drive of the third quarter, he was a uh, his gait was a little bit off. But I I think the Weber game plan is what limited most of McCoy's potential scrambling opportunities. When the blitzes came, they were essentially untouched right down the middle. He had no time to really do much. I counted a single play where I feel that McCoy 
potentially having injury issues prevented him from scrambling the way we're used to his drive in the fourth quarter. I typically expect him to spin away from where the defense was coming from. Instead, he kept kind of shuffling to his left and threw it away. But Weber state did exactly what they wanted to do defensively. Idaho had only a couple big plays and the Vandals did not capitalize on those big plays that led to turnovers or punts afterward. And Weber state offensively when they took their shots, Munoz was on man. Uh, Munoz made some very good passes. Um, Armani Arnold in the corner was picked on a little bit uh, throughout this game, but yeah, I have to give credits. Uh, the passes that Munoz completed for touchdowns or longer gains. Those are good plays. Uh, those are the kind of he. Those were passes where he put him where no one, essentially only the the offensive player could get him or the wide receiver just had our our DBs beat. Yep. So Brian, I want to I want to I wanna jump in very quickly just to give some stats about Munoz. Munoz had 152 yards. He had completions of 39 yards, 37 yards, 23 yards, and 27 yards. He had over two thirds of his passes of his passing yards on four passes. That was like those big shots were just yeah. killer. Sorry, continue your point. I just wanted to point out statistically, well, yeah, the, there were four huge plays that he made. Well, yeah, and the, the this is why I brought my initial point. Every single drive, Weber had big plays. They scored. Whether it was um, Chris Jackson breaking back to back twenty five yard rushes to score, turned into scores. Whether it was Munoz completing long passes that. One was a touchdown. One led one like what went out. The dude went down like the two yard line, and then Weaver scored a touchdown. When Weaver had a chance, like they they put the nails in the coffin. They they could, and they limited Idaho to scoring on long drives. And a lot of some, not all those long drives were points. And look, the first two drives Idaho has in the game, they were classic Eck drives of. Five minutes, 25 seconds, first drive, six minutes and four seconds, the second drive. Though, So that 11 and a half minutes of possession yielded three points. So even though Weaver was kept on ice, it was still, it was very close to a 0-0 game after that. So again, Idaho had chances, but we, Weaver came to play. And to me, Idaho, Idaho did not. Uh, well, not the whole game, but like with the chances Idaho had to shut the door, they didn't. And Weaver State did step up where they could. Yeah, no, I completely agree, Brian. And there's, there's obviously some, uh, some talk about the coaching decisions, maybe not being the greatest in this game. I don't know if I fully agree with that. Um, again, McCoy threw the ball 51 times. Like, yes, they averaged under three yards of carry, like running the ball was obviously not getting it done against Weaver's defense. Um, again, I don't know if that's because of offensive line, you're missing woods. Well, just, again, there's a bunch of factors around this. But even if you if you go back in and you look and, and say, okay, well, Idaho went for it on fourth down a handful of times, didn't get it, could have kicked a field goal or two in there. One field goal ended up being the difference. That's not really how it worked. I know Idaho scored with 12 seconds left to make this a, a one-score game, but realistically, the game was over with two and a half minutes to go when Weber went up 10 points with, with two and a half minutes to go. It was just that, look, you needed everything to go perfect and then some for Idaho to win that game. So going back and critiquing, like, hey, did, should have taken the points here. I, like, In retrospect, yes, but this is the way Eck and Co. run this program, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with going for the win, going for the points. In the long run, I think it's the correct analytical decision to be going for the points, but it does hurt in retrospect when you see a two-point loss and think, okay, well, there's a couple – couple field goals that were probably left out there you do have the best kicker in the fcs i think yeah he's probably gonna hit some of those uh, you, the second drive that ended on the weber state 30 it's a 47 yard field goal for chavez after he'd already hit a 50 yarder today like it, it's it, yeah you can point those things out but i think brian that's that's a reductionist way of saying just in all phases of the game idaho just idaho was beat by weber state and it is what it is it sucks. It, it does not look good on paper. But again, like we said, I think Munoz plays this whole season and this is a playoff team. They have all Americans on all side of the ball. Like all credit to Weber State. This is not, you know, shots fired in Northern Colorado. This is not Northern Colorado where you go up against a zero and now 10 team and go out and look really bad. Yeah, Idaho definitely didn't look great. One of the worst games of the season, but. Weber State also came to play. That is a very good team over there. Again, they just were missing the quarterback for most of the year. 
Yeah, and look, my takeaway here is I'm going to steal a point made by Coulter Nuanis, who you know he he's, was on our show for the for the Montana preview. He I listened to his show. He's talking about the top three teams in the Big Sky, and his view on Idaho is that talent wise. Now this is talking about like the entire team, the the totality of contributors on the team, is that Idaho is objectively the number three out of Montana, Montana State, in relative to depth. But Idaho offensively, especially, has easily the biggest difference makers in the conference, which is to say, look, it's X second year. So the, obviously there's no reason to believe the depth should be there. Montana State is in year five or six of their rebuild dating back to the choke time. Montana's in year five or six dating back to Hauk being hired, but Hauk was not hired to replace a dumpster fire. He was hired to replace a team that was, what, seven and four, six and five around that level. These two teams that are, are ahead of Idaho – they're much they're much deeper because they've had more continuity, so they should be further ahead. But then that's just to say, look, Idaho with the offensive line limitations they've had from day one, that would have been if Elijah Sanchez did not go down. Idaho just does not have the margin for error to have guys out. Well, we already just covered. We're down our center. Um, the, and then lost Leighton Vining as well in the game. Yep. So down another center. Down Okay, down to center number three. Uh, number one running back for Idaho, Anthony Woods, who is, if he's not the best running back in the conference, he's somewhere, he's either one, two, or three, depending on what you're valuing, what you're paying attention to. He's out. And though Nick Romano's solid, I think Nick Romano is a very good change of pace back who would start at virtually no big sky school. Uh, that's, he's a great asset to have, but Idaho took a pretty big step down, losing a difference maker. And if McCoy was limited, I like you and I, Dallas probably disagree on the extent to McCoy being potentially being injured, a uh, lower body impacted this game. I think it impacted like two plays, but even with how close this game is, Hey, those two plays could have been the difference. Well, suddenly Idaho's margin for error. Once you factor those things in against better teams, it's pretty dang limited. And you saw that margin for error in the second half. Idaho has seven possessions in the second half. They scored twice. One was, the, you know, two touchdowns. One was that the second possession touchdown and last possession touchdown. But in between, other than those two in the second half, Idaho loses two fumbles, loses a turnover on downs. That's three turnovers for Idaho in addition to two punts. Uh, part of that was Idaho not executing. Part of that was Weber State doing what they wanted to. But this is, Idaho's just not, if you look at the, the schedule Idaho's played this year, offensively, they're not hitting, they're not running in fifth gear like they were early in the season. You know, the last time Idaho broke 30 points was Cal Poly. Uh, so, you know, our last four games of Idaho scoring, it's 21 against Montana, 24 in the win against Montana State, but still 24 is not that many points. The offense engineered 20 of the 27 against Northern Colorado, and then Idaho did get to 29 with that with a super late touchdown. But this is this team is not humming like they were in that three game run after losing to Cal of 36 against Sac State, 44 against Eastern, and 42 against Cal Poly. And if Idaho's not going to be able to score that well, that puts a lot of pressure on a defense that for Idaho is solid. But look, they've picked off three passes in all of Big Sky play. This Idaho just does not force turnovers. They're they're the number ten team in the Big Sky in in sacks. The this defense again, not not a put down to any of the guys. There's a lot of guys we like, a lot of solid players. It isn't winning ball games or helping win ball games the way the defense did that last year, which means this offense has to put up points. And if they're going to hold the ball like they did in the first half and put up three, that that that's not going to work. Uh, if Idaho's going to hold on to the ball, those have to turn into touchdowns. Otherwise, d- defensively against better teams, I mean we. I, the defense is more healthy now than it was four weeks ago. And, you know, just gave up 31 to Weber state who does look better. But I I think that's just, that's where we're at. This team is going to win games because of its offense and its defense is going to contribute. But off offensively, that means they have to buy the defensive side margin for error. And that has not happened for four weeks. Yeah, that's, I mean, Brian, that is the, I think the one critique of the coaching staff minus the Montana state first half. Yes, I think I think that is the one critique of the coaching staff that is valid at this point is if you're going to play ball control, you have to put points on the board. And that is the one problem that's happening right now is Idaho is trying to dominate the time of possession like they typically do. But when you are not scoring points, 
and your defense is not taking the ball away like they did. Uh, Patty in the comment section, something to note, we've dropped like 10 million picks this year. It obviously has not been that many, but the, the turnovers are not happening to the extent. And it, it is, again, sometimes just the way the ball bounces. It just doesn't happen. Don't force as many fumbles. The interceptions that come to you bounce off of hands, bounce off of faces. Like that thing, it just happens from year to year. It's so variable. But when you are in a down year like this, you have to put the points on the board. And it's just not happening right now, which is very, it's very tough to win if you're trying to kill the clock, but you're not putting those points up. Uh, I do want to point out Captain 58 saying defense has to get three and outs. It's tough to rely on. That is a problem. I I feel like it's been consistently a problem for quite honestly most of the season. Idaho does not get off the the field well on third down. It just is not happening this year like it was last year. Which again, like hey, we don't don't mean to like be shitting on the team or something like that. There's a ton of young dudes who play. This is a good problem that Idaho is playing the youth they have defensively and are still we still heading into this week. We're talking about can Idaho be the two seed. So like this is, it's not all a bad problem, but you're right. And I think, Hey, this is a complaint. I would like, I've heard people talk about it. I sometimes have, have uh, kind of questioned some of the fourth down call Jason next has. I just want to bring up every coach has their idiosyncrasies, their personalities, you know, like look at Montana, Bobby Hawk's going to be conservative in the second half. It doesn't matter what you think of Bobby Hawk should do. That is who he is. That's what's going to happen. If you're a Grizz fan, you just hope he modulates enough. Jason Eck is going to be aggressive. That is who he is. That's not going away. That's part of why we love him. But part of why he's uh, he's been as aggressive as he has been on fourth down, I believe. And sometimes, look, the going for it on fourth and 10 at your own 15, down seven, um, I, uh, questionable. But what it's showing is kind of what you said, Dallas. There just isn't the trust in the ability of the defense to get off the field quick. And... Because of that, okay, if that's if that's who you are, and Eck has the jury's in, that's how Jason Eck feels. Go back to the Cal game. Didn't did not trust the defense uh to to get stops. That's why he, he there was a fourth down, he went for a touchdown. He tried to go for first down instead of instead of take three. Uh Kevin Marshall's right, sometimes a punt or three isn't a bad thing, but this is this is just where the team is. Clearly, if the team is going to be fourth down late um, or questionable. Eck has shown he is not yet trusting of the defense enough. Um, so I guess that to me, my takeaway here is look, I love you. I love Eck. I love how aggressive he is. I hope he finds a way to be 80% of that aggressive um, in, in some games. Cause um, look, Weber state, if you look at the Weber state drives, they didn't actually have a ton of long drives against Idaho. Most of it was big plays or being set up by Idaho turnovers in a short field. But having lapses and tackling like we've seen throughout the year. Well, Hey, that's, that's why you might maybe don't trust your defense with three minutes left in the game to get the ball back to the offense. You know, the one thing I will, I will say, Brian is I do think that this is still honestly a masterclass in coaching. When you, you take all of the points that we've talked about, you have the best quarterback in the FCS. He got hurt at the end of last year and, obviously impacted the team he's dinged up this year which again who's not like there's not like there's any team that's like just trotting out every guy is healthy like every every team's got injuries every team's got guys that are have, that have nagging things again anthony woods missed this game but i think we've all seen it anthony woods has has had little things pop up here and there all season long it's what you deal with you have an offensive line that is obviously struggling in pass protection and weren't necessarily top of the class when they were fully healthy. So now you're you're talking you've got a quarterback that's injured, a line that can't hold up particularly well. You're missing your best running back. Your defense isn't taking the ball away and you have a ton of youth all across the field. This is unfortunately I think this is kind of what has to happen. Idaho has to control the ball like this and kill that clock because you you are so young. Nate Meek saying if we had more juniors and seniors, Eck wouldn't have to take the fourth down risks. I do think there is some truth to that. I think if it was not so fluctual, you would be able to get away with, with taking the punts and three points a little bit more. I understand why the coaching staff is doing things the way they are. Because again, 
I, and I, I don't mean to take shots at anybody here, but Jackson Eck had one tackle today. A couple weeks ago, we were talking about, holy crap, Jackson Eck looks like he's going to be an all-pro guy next year or all-conference guy next year. He had one tackle. He was a starter that, that got one tackle. X, X looked great. Eck didn't put up the numbers, missed some tackles. X missed a with, pretty big tackle on the Chris yeah. Jackson touchdown too. Like, like Young guys miss tackles. It happens. Like sometimes it's, hey, they have a couple rough spots. Sometimes it's a whole game of rough spots. Like this is what happens with, with young guys. Like it happens with the old guys too, obviously, but it happens more with the young guys that are just establishing themselves. Uh, Crewhead76 says it all. We're bitching, but that's all because we care. Love this team and stuff. Like I, I fully agree. I think like, I, I, yes. Does this loss feel demoralizing as hell? Yes. Is it devastating to see Idaho had a shot at the two seed and home games all the way to the championship game in the Kibbe Dome? And now that's gone? Yes. That is absolutely demoralizing. But this is still a playoff team. This is still a team that has a chance at a seed. It's, again, you're going to have to root for Montana this week to, to hope for that. And you're going to have to hope for some other things to happen. Worst case scenario, Idaho goes on the road for the first round again. But this is still an incredible place for this program to be at in year two of the Eck era after everything that we just saw Idaho football go through in the last 25 years. And Tom Kendall saying everything that I need to know. I love how Coach Eck took all accountability in the postgame interview. Only blamed himself saying he's got to do better. True class. That's what you're, That's what a college coach is supposed to do. It's a bunch of college kids out there. You're supposed to take the accountability on yourself. And he's I feel been like open since he's been here too. his belief about how you, how you manage players today is you praise in public, you correct in private. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's how it should be. Like this, this program is headed in the right direction. The guy in charge is doing the right things. Sometimes these kinds of things are going to happen because it's year two taking over from a guy who couldn't find, you know, his ass from his elbow for the last four years. So it sucks guys, but like, keep that in perspective. This is still a playoff team. Going to be back-to-back winning seasons, back-to-back playoff seasons. This is frustrating, yes. But long-term, these are good building blocks. Uh, Patty saying, we're talking about two true freshmen missing a few tackles after having amazing performances. Super bright future. Nate Meek saying, yeah, there's 61 freshmen on this roster. Like this is This is just what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Montana and Montana state are not starting freshmen at keys, keys pl- spots defensively. They're, that's just the, na- that's the nature of being in year two of the rebuild versus year six of the rebuild, depending on how you choose to count. Um, Got to hit sponsor before we get to some other points, snake over stampede Canadian whiskey. Cause uh, well, we've I feel like the discussion has been good Dallas, but we torpedoed ourselves immediately talking about a loss. Cause we're, we're outside. This isn't basketball last year, so we're not ready for it. Snake River Stampede Canadian Whiskey. Look, th- there's no there's no option if you go to Snake River for your whiskey where you're going to go wrong. If you get the Snake River Stampede, that's $25.95 a fifth, $45.95 a handle, the only size I buy. It's got a double barrel finish, uh, first old bourbon, then Oloroso sherry casks. Now, if you're celebrating, which full disclosure, last night there was no 1915 small batch pour- poured in my house. But the 1915 small batch, it's aged an additional two years. It's double barrel finish is first fill bourbon, then ex Canadian rye whiskey casks. No matter which option you go with, they're two of the best buys in the Idaho State Liquor Store. Give Snake River a shot. So, Dallas, the point I was going to get to for the for talking about my favorite whiskey is. I think what the tone you hear from us, the tone in our Discord, which by the way, it was still our the tub, hashtag only tubs Discord, still fun as hell. Um it does not have internet dumpster fire garbage in it. That's just, that's not how the members are. It doesn't work that way. Um, that's probably what makes it fun. But um, the hurt I think a lot of Vandals had is after that Montana state win, it felt like Idaho, ha- Idaho is showing. We don't really know what the ceiling is of this team. As in, this could be a final four team. This could be if with the right draw championship team. And these last two weeks, though Idaho's one and one, it feels like we're recalibrating back to what we would have said week one. We'd call an absolute home run of the team ceiling feels like it's potentially getting into the quarters, which would tie for, I think, the best Idaho FCS, you know, Division One AA season in the history of the school. So you're you're right to bring up, hey, dudes, like the sky's not falling. What hurts is feeling like we had a we we had already arrived 
at nationally elite. Instead of that, Idaho is just nationally very good. And at a level that a lot of schools would kill for, including us, we remember two years ago, uh, you know, where losses were us bitching about how it sucks because it did. Uh, but that's, look, that's not where we're at. We're at the point where losing hurts because it means like you lost a potential future you thought was different. But the, again, that I, I can't le- quit talking about this game without feeling mixed. I just hit the down part. We've already hit the fact that we were playing freshmen. Um, I just think the reality for Idaho fans is our margin for error is just, it is much thinner than what Montana or Montana state has um, heading into matchups with better teams and Weber state on paper, a bad loss, but in reality, not a bad loss. This is not a bad football team. You know, this certainly is a team better than Northern Arizona. This is a team now that's looking better than Portland state. If they played Eastern today, Weber state probably wins in the last three games in Munoz. They're averaging just under 30 points per game. That make them the number five offense in the big sky which is a completely different offensive monster than we've seen for Weber for the most part in the last five years. The team's getting it that Weber state's getting it together and picking up wins to kind of build into next year for Idaho. It's about, okay, can Idaho rebound from this loss? So I I don't think you'd call this performance Dallas rebounding from the Northern Colorado game, Uh, but Idaho has got a week to rebound and hope some things go right uh, before we're talking playoffs. Brian, I do want to quickly jump in. Uh, Idaho's made to the semifinals twice, the FCS playoffs, 1988 and 1993. Uh, Other than that, Idaho has advanced out of the first round five times. Okay, so this would tie for the third. If Idaho makes the quarters, it ties for the third most successful season in FCS 1AA history for the Vandals. Yes. Not too bad for year two. No. Again, guys, like... I. I love Vandal football. I love Vandal football probably more than my wife, and she'd probably tell you that right to your face. Idaho has historically been dog shit at football. I don't know if anybody has ever cared to look across the history of Vandal football. Idaho's winning percentage is like 43%. Like, this is not like, this is not something that we're going to be used to. Like, there's not a history of winning here. I know that, again, the 80s and 90s were great in the big sky. Outside of that, Idaho has just pretty much been terrible at football forever. Like it is going to take time to turn this into a program that like the Montana, Montana state that I think we're all hoping is going to happen. With that said, it is like, I know I am somebody who gets very emotional. I get very, very overreactive. Sometimes Uh, I've definitely said a bunch of shit on this show that I look back in retrospect, like, wow, Dallas, that was really stupid. And, I hate everything about myself. I think everything I do is stupid. So to think, oh, I said that on a podcast and that was bad. Like that's that's some really terrible stuff. What I'm getting at is I have to remind myself, this is not expected. Guys, three bowl, bowl seasons in what, 25 years? Like the sky is not falling. Does it suck to have to, yeah, probably reevaluate expectations? Like you said, Brian, this is probably a team that, hey, you make it into the final eight fantastic hell of a hell of a job guys you make it farther than that like we had obviously been optimistically looking at maybe two weeks ago yeah it stings a little bit but like you said brian there's i can't i can't i can't heart uh, i can't harden on this point enough this is year two of jason eck taking over what had mostly been nine years of sadness and before that, it had been six years of sadness. And then you just keep going back through all the coaches that came before this. It has just been sadness here. No, Dennis Erickson is a legend in Idaho, partially because of what he did away from Idaho. He made it out of the first round of the playoffs once. Like, it, it's it's very important to remind that. Crew at 76, uh, not to, like, pat myself on the back, but Amen Hammer, we love this damn su- stuff so much we overreact. Like, that... That is obviously what we do a little bit here. Uh, I, I hand up. I know I'm very guilty of that, but we're we're talking about Idaho going to the playoffs for what the like thirteenth time, fourteenth time, Brian, whatever. I, I forget the exact number. Like over Idaho playing football since the late 1800s. There's not a whole lot of success here, and I can't like I, I know that we're we're picking apart like all these things that went wrong against Weber State, but in context, yeah, bad loss uh, in a great season, 
Next week, Idaho State comes to town. Idaho State matches up so poorly with Idaho. Should get a nice good bounce back, and then we'll be all all fucking shun, sunshine and roses here. But yeah, right now, it, this by sucks. the way, it, if Idaho will make the playoffs, this will be their this will be a thirteenth time in program history. If you want to count the bowl games, sixteenth uh, postseason, seventeenth. Right? No, yeah, numbers are hard. Yeah, you're right. Three bowl games. We're at, we're at twelve yeah. plus three is fifteen. This be plus three. I I did that in my head. I was like twelve plus three. Plus, no, that's that's seventeen. Uh, it's just a uh, brain brain not working so great. Uh, Bear Claw Media. I know will be fine, but maybe they didn't get all the Greeley cow stink off of them. That is probably exactly what happened. Between that and Tom Kendall not going to the game. Those are the two reasons Idaho didn't win. Uh, Tom Kendall, speaking of, still hung over from the MSU win, I think. Uh, it's fair to say, again, one of the biggest wins that this program is going to see. And again, you're talking about a bunch of young guys. Again, extraordinarily young roster here. One of the ro- youngest rosters across the FCS that is consistently in the top 10, consistently playing good teams, and not again, knocked off what was the number two team in the country. Like You're going to get these letdowns alongside those highs that realistically... Montana State's a better team than Idaho. I'm going to say that right now. I, I might get eviscerated in the comment section. I might get roasted on Twitter for that. Montana State's a better program than Idaho right now. It just I is. Mean, certainly since since Idaho won, like, I mean, do, do you, with what you've seen on Idaho the last two games, do you want any part of a rematch with Montana State in the playoffs? No. No, 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 no. no which, no, I mean, no, look, no, doesn't no. mean they can't get, they can't get together. I think uh, getting a win and hoping for things to go right to get healthy on a bye week. Uh, I think that will matter a ton for, for Idaho, but um, you know, Dallas, I think we, we probably got to get to players of the game after we hear from one of our favorite sponsors. Yes, Brian, that is probably a great idea. If you are looking for a great all-inclusive week-long vacation, don't look past your backyard. Hughes River Expeditions has been vandal owned and operated since 1976, and they're ready to take you on the vacation of a lifetime. Enjoy a multi-day trip down the Middle Fork of the Salmon, the main Salmon River of No Return, the Salmon River Canyons, or even the Selway. You can check out special trips like one to see the Persed Meteor Shower. Camp on pristine beaches, or as Brian says, pristine bitches. Run amazing whitewater, hike scenic trails, spot wildlife, soak in beautiful natural hot springs. And again, like always, fish the most remote stretches of river in the entire country. Just bring your clothes, let Colin and HRE handle the rest. Grab a paddle, catch dinner, and ride the bull all throughout the Gem State. Call them now, 800-262-1882, or check them out at HughesRiver.com. Brian? I do want to give Ron Lowney a shout-out. for he, look, he came back after the Montana State loss, and if you're watching the episode live, participate in the comment section. Ron is taking a well-earned victory lap after Montana State had beaten Weber State 40-0 to zero, uh, early in the season. That's Ron saying, let's put it into proper perspective of what it means to play on the road in December. Yep, yeah, look, I mean, that's why I now understand Idaho as, you know, kind of the ceiling is making the final eight. If the matchups are right in the final eight, fingers crossed, it can work out. Because also, hey, once the bracket is set, teams have to actually win to continue hosting. So uh, I, I just think Idaho's move to the – to the position of they need some help. They need some things to break in their direction. And heading into this week, that was not the case. Idaho more or less controlled their destiny. But Dallas, I stole the wheel from you. Offensive player of the game. Brian, there's really only one answer for this. I thought Hayden Hatton had the most Hayden Hatton game of all Hayden Hatton games. 14 receptions, 175 yards and a touchdown. The guy was unguardable. Looked like, again, just a vintage Hayden Hatton performance. Can't really say anything else about it. It was just business as usual for the guy. I do want to acknowledge Giovanni McCoy did have a good game. 33 of 51 for for three 346 yards and a touchdown. Did like was sacked three times, but I, I put none of those sacks on McCoy. Like none of those were him holding on to the ball too long. Yeah, Hayden Hatton had an all American game. Uh you already brought up the stats. Every big play Idaho had, and when I say big play, like over 10 yards, every one of them was Hayden Hatton. Um, yeah, uh, the crew had 76 calls and touchdown Jesus hey, Jesus Hatton. Um, yeah, dude. Look, now, like, at least to Hayden Hatton's credit, he had to wait a while to get more of these reps because of how Idaho was running earlier in the year. So glad he's at least getting them. 
but no, I, I don't really think there's a second player to reference offensively. So with that understood, a defensively player of the game. And this one's obviously going to be a tougher because again, Idaho, no sacks, Idaho, no, no turnovers, really not a lot of statistical prowess here. Um, Marcus Harris, uh, shout out had a couple pass breakups, but I know Brian, you mentioned X had that missed tackle, but for the the most part, I thought X re Alexander looked like he's going to be the best player on the Vandal defense in very short order. It's not going to be this season, but I think in the near future, very, very soon, those freshman growing pains are going to be gone. And this dude might end up being the best linebacker in, in the country. So I'm going to give it to X because I thought in a, a whole, I thought he had a pretty good game. Yeah, I'm going to go with Jakari Larmond. Um, I just based off what the, the Weaver passing was uh, Marcus Harris. Marcus Harris was certainly not the dude picked on. So like you, you could make a case for him. You can make a case for, for Tommy McCormick as well. Uh, but uh, to me, I'm going to, uh, it's hard to name a specific dude on this team. Cause it was not a terrible defensive outing, but it was not a, uh, it was not like an apex level outing, uh, but Chikari Larman was, dis- you know, he was disruptive online. He also had a, he saved a touchdown uh, running, running down. It was I believe it was Chris Jackson from behind, which was pretty damn impressive. And then Patty first saying Chikari got his hands on another field goal. The, so the replay that I watched, it looked like it was not 100% conclusive, but I'm 100% going to say Patty's right. He got his hand on it. So that's why I'm going for Chikari Larman. Um, any so Dallas, any other takeaways you have from this game? Um, yeah, Ricardo Chavez is fucking awesome, and I'm gonna really miss that guy. Uh, averaged 47.3 yards a punt today. Uh, again, I keep saying today because I'm used to our instant reactions actually being the day of, uh, but a couple field goals again, I hit a 53 yarder that was just purely right down the middle. Uh, the guy is. Uh, for a school that has been pretty well known for having kickers and punters, because that was about the only thing Idaho was any good at for damn near 30 years. Chavez is going to be one of my favorites that's ever come through this program. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any disagreement on them to say like, yeah, uh, Chavez has been really damn good. Hit at, he hit that like what 51 yarder against Montana state. And I thought that was kick ass. And he hits a 53 yarder against Weber state. Uh, yeah, dude, uh, Chavez pretty damn good. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I'm, I'm, we're purposely not talking about playoff stuff because I'm doing a pretty thorough breakdown of playoff implications for Idaho, Montana, Montana State when I record tonight on the Big Sky Podcast Network episode. But um, I don't know, man. Um, this is, it's one of the, it. It just sucks. It sucks to lose. Um, it is made a little bit better knowing that Boise State fired Andy Avalos uh, this mo- today. So, uh, Brian, Boise that State- is that is not making it better. That is absolutely making it worse. Okay, well, making it better and making it worse, it, making it worse because Boise State gets to look firing a coach makes you look bad, um, unless you are aggressive and have the money to fire early-ish. like seventy but- million dollars early-ish. Shout out Jimbo Fisher. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, but hey, Avalos, we enjoyed the downward trajectory. I felt like he was um, a very good hashtag right track guide for Boise State. I um, think he could have turned into Coach K if they would have kept him there for five or six more years. Yes. Um, I also enjoy that Boise State has another chance to screw up their head coaching search. I do believe that uh, I think that I still think the DNA of Boise State is going to have them write off some very good candidates because they're not prestigious enough if they can't get Kellen Moore. And I, I expect they can't because it, my understanding is Kellen Moore would have been in for the job before he got a significant pay raise. Yeah, don't forget Kellen Moore probably getting fired this year. Okay, so hey, maybe they can get Kellen Moore. I still think that school whiff not not going after Jeff Choate. And now because he's been a co-defensive coordinator slash coordinated at, uh, at Texas, there's a little more prestige around that name. I don't think they're going to be willing to go there, but um, takeaway again, I guess broader takeaways I have, we've, we've talked through them quite a bit. Um, the, the, look, this is not a loss. Like Paul Petrino time is not a loss. Like Zach Kloss time. Um, the like coaching decisions we would, we're at, that we'd be asking about. We're talking about like three plays uh, or we're talking about, Hey, like maybe they should have blitzed a little bit more, but keep in mind, Idaho has been 
not very good at blitzing in the first place this year. They're exactly third to last in the league in sacks, uh, 10 total. So I don't know how much you want to sell out on the blitz when you're not really getting to the quarterback in the first place. What happens when you blitz and you've got a bunch of young guys in coverage? You're relying on all of them to not make a single mistake, and you make one single mistake, yeah. and that play's done. You know, we're talking about margin for error of what Idaho has offensively in spite of being a good, good offense. Um, they're la- big. Idaho is last in the big sky and sacks allowed at 22. So we're talking about a team, Idaho, that is going to ha- has a very good, still has a reasonable shot at being a six, seven, or eight seed. And they are worse at giving up sacks than Northern Colorado and Cal Poly. That's just, that's what Idaho has line wise. That is what happens when you have young players contributing at important positions. It's part of the growing, it's just part of the, the growth curve of this team. It's both a good and bad problem. They're very good playing those young guys anyway, guys. Let's not forget that. But, you know, no one's going to win a national title. No one's going to make a semifinal if you if you have this many freshman guys starting at important positions on the O-line or, you know, in linebacker. That's that's the nature of these teams, guys. South Dakota State's been building forever. Montana, Montana State, they've been building forever. Idaho's in year two. Yeah, I mean, it just this is what's going to happen. You're going to get growing pains, like I, I said a little bit ago. Yeah, you get this huge high, this huge incredible upset win over a Montana State program that is certainly farther along than Idaho's, obviously, from what you've seen them do over the last few years. You also are going to get these letdowns. It's just going to happen. Until some of the, the youth infusion that Eck has brought to this program, until some of those guys have aged up a little bit, this is just going to happen. But what's going to be a fucking blast is watching these guys turn into what Montana State is right now. That's I fully believe that's going to happen, Brian. I fully believe that this program is going to be an absolute world beater. All that's going to have, have to happen is just guys got just got to get a little bit bigger, a little bit older. That's all that's going to have to happen. Yep. All right, dudes. Well, hey. Again, we have one more one more regular season game. Uh, we're more or less quite confident about a playoff game for sure, whether that's first round or second round, we're going to see. Uh, but remember, join the patreon.com backslash tubs of the club, hashtag only tubs discord, still fun to sell. Best benefit of joining the Patreon. It's a great way to meet a ton of people that you will then you'll then see at games. That's that's a ton of the crew that I meet now at games with people who I got to know through doing the in the tubs discord so uh helps out it costs 250 only cost 250 a month that's it if you want if you want to do more we will not stop you but 250 a month that's it it supports the show help us out patreon.com backslash tubs of club and if you have not yet hit subscribe on youtube please do that too it potentially helps us get some money from youtube and cost you nothing hit subscribe button thank you guys for your support with that if you ain't vandal you ain't shit go vandals go vandals <laughs>